وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد We were speaking about Al-Qawaid principles in giving da'wah and we mentioned six principles and we said the principles that we're going to mention are going to be <coughs> 22 principles So we're now inshallah ta'ala going to give the seventh principle inshallah The seventh principle is that which is made haram when the ability is there is made obligatory when there is not when the ability is absent so what is prohibited when the ability is there is made mandatory when the ability is absent i'll repeat that again whatever is made prohibited when the person has the ability becomes obligatory when there is no ability that same thing becomes obligatory an example for that would be at tayammum inda wujud al ma tayammum when there is water is haram because the ability is there lakin it becomes obligatory when you can't use the water for you to use it so it's haram ma al qudrah it's haram with the ability wajib ma al ajzi and it's obligatory when the ability is absent you now have to use the water and that is for every single thing in which a person is able to do or is not able to do if he's able to do it he has to come with it and it's haram for him to stay away from it. it's haram for him to stay away from it but it becomes obligatory to to do it ibn al-qayyim rahimahullah when it came to the situations pertaining to the individual when it comes to the issue of ability and not having ability he categorized it into four he said ay yakun al mukallaf the individual is qadiran he's able physically is able he is physically able has the ability physical ability and he is also to able to what execute the command of allah so he's got the physical ability and he has the ability to execute the action of doing this particular issue this individual then it becomes obligatory for him to do it an example for that is a person who has he has the physical ability to do hajj and he has the wealth and the means to get there okay so it's upon him to what fayajib alayhi al-imtithal it's obligatory for that person to do it The second one is the person is unable to do both of them. He's bedded, his body can't do it. Nor can he even execute the action as well. For example, a person who is sick and doesn't also have water. So his maridun the qudratul badaniyah is missing from him. The physical ability is missing from him. And he also doesn't have water which he can't come with the fi'lul ma'muri. the thing that he was commanded to do the third one is ay yakuna ajizan bi badani he's physically unable to do it physically can't do it but he's able to execute the command of allah and how is that like the one who can't physically go hajj but he has the wealth for the action to be done the command of allah can be done he has the wealth for it or he is unable to fast like he is able to provide food for those who could for those who are in need can provide for them in this situation it's obligatory for him to what fayajib alayhi al-it'am he has to give the food and the one who is unable to go hajj physically but he has the wealth fayajib alayhi al-hajj bi mali he has to give the money now why because the fi'l al-ma'muri the doing the command is what's needed from him the fourth one is ay yakuna qadiran bi badanihi 
he is physically able عَجِزًا عَنِ الْمَأْمُورِ بِهِ but he can't follow the command he what? he can't follow the command this one the scholars they say فَيَجِبُ عَلَيْهِ الْإِنْتِقَالِ this individual because he's physically able to do it he has the physical ability of doing it Ibn Al-Qayyim says he has to move from one of the commands to another command example for that is he moves intiqal ila tayammum he moves on to tayammum because he has the ability to do the water he moves on to what? he moves on to the tayammum but if he hasn't got anything else to do he has no other badil he hasn't got anything else, anything else to take its place um, if this is the situation فَإِنَّهُ يُصَلِّ عَلَى حَالِهِ He prays in his situation وَلَا يُعِيدُ Like for example He hasn't got the clothing to wear He hasn't got the clothing to wear And there's no badil There's nothing he can place on himself if, if This situation فَإِنَّهُ يُصَلِّ عَلَى حَالِهِ وَلَا يُعِيدُ He will play, pray in the situation that he's in And he will not have to bring it back He will not have to He will not have to bring it back What's the evidence for this particular principle? It's the statement of Allah, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ جُنُوبًا If you're in a state of janaba, فَاطَّهَرُوا Purify yourself. وَإِن كُنْتُمْ مَرْضَى أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ And if you are a tra traveler, or you're ill, أَوْ جَاءَ أَحَدٌ مِّنْكُمْ مِنَ الْغَائِطِ Or if one of you comes from his call of nature, أَوْ لَا مَسْتُمُ النِّسَاءَ Or you've had sexual intercourse with your wife, with a woman, فَلَمْ تَجِدُوا مَاءً And you can't find water, سَعِيدًا طَيِّبًا With a pure surface. فَمْسَحُوا بِوُجُوهِكُمْ Wipe over your faces وَأَيْدِيَكُمْ And your hands مِنْهُ from it. So here, what do we take from the وَجُوا الدَّلَالَةَ From the ayah. What are we trying to extract from the ayah? We're trying to extract from the ayah that the tayammum for the individual at the get-go is not permissible. You're not allowed to do tayammum from the get-go. You are permitted when there is marad and safar involved. Or that you've come from the call of nature, okay, and you haven't got the water to use. In these situations, it now is permissible for you. So it gives us the qa'idah, which is what? The qa'idah that we mentioned, that it's haram al qudra. When the ability is there, it's haram for you to do tayammum. Lakin it is wajib. It's obligatory when you're what? When you are a person who hasn't got the ability to use the water or you don't have the water. An example for this also is the hadith of Imran ibn Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He said, Imran, I had an illness. فَسَأَلْتُ النَّبِيَ I asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam عَنِ praying. فَقَالَ He said to me, صَلِّ قَائِمًا Stand up and pray. فَإِنْ لَمْ تَسْتَطِعْ But if you're not able فَقَاعِدًا Pray sitting فَإِنْ لَمْ تَسْتَطِعْ And if you're not able فَعَلَى جَنْبٍ Pray on your side Here we see the Prophet commanding him three times He instructs him three times The first instruction is that he prays standing up But that is when That is He has to follow this command Which is what? Because he has the ability But it's haram for him to follow the second command Which is to sit down why? Because the, the qudra is there, the ability is there. Lakin qu'ud, which is to sit down, becomes obligatory on him when the lack of it, when he's unable to what? When he's unable to stand up. When he's unable to stand up. This qa'idah, uh, this principle, how does it apply on the issue of da'wah? The way that it applies on da'wah is that يَجُوزُ It is permissible تَوْلِيَ تُغَيْرِ أَهْلِ لِلْضَرُورَةِ It is permissible to place in charge of somebody who's not fit for this position when there's a necessity. إِذَا كَانَ أَصْلَحَ الْمَوْجُودِ The person who's better and greater is present. In this situation, because of the fact that there's no ability to put anyone else in place, okay, or there is no ability then in this situation, it is not, uh, it's permissible. It is permissible. But even then, the Muslims are still working towards what? Islah al-Ahwal, to perfect the situation until the matter becomes complete. Also, if you're in a situation where a person took a person's wealth 
They took it from them. Do we let, and we're not able to take that wealth to the person who was owned by it, I mean, who owned it. So somebody took somebody else, somebody else's wealth. They unjustly, they robbed it. Okay? Do we, and we don't know who the person is, or we can't take it to that person, do we let that wealth remain in the hand of the oppressor? Or should we take it away from him and place it in what? Fil Masalih al the general usage of the Muslims. We took it to Al Masalih al Why? Because it's better min biqa'iha biyadi dhalimi for it to remain in the hand of the oppressor. It is better to take it out of his hands and to use it for the Masalih al than for it to remain in the hand of who? The oppressor, the wrongdoer who took the wealth unjustly. Number, the other benefit that we take, I mean, the other way that this hadith applies with our da'wah is that it is permissible that if a kingdom starts in the religion, there's kingdom now. The umara, the leaders are what? They're kings. as wa ta'ah, that we obey them. It's permissible to obey them and to listen to them. Fi dhalika, in this situation, because we're unable to come with what? Khilafah, ala minhaj al Khilafah, in the form of in a prophetic tradition, in a prophetic way, we're unable to come with it. Then we are permitted and we, are, we should listen and obey in this particular issue because, and rather it's obligatory, because the issue here is that we don't have the ability. And so what becomes obligatory is to listen. The eighth qa'ida is الذريعه الى الفساد the thing that will lead to harm يجب سدها it is obligatory to block it off anything that's going to lead to corruption and harm it's obligatory to block it off اذا لم يعارضها مصلحه راجحه if there doesn't come opposing it a maslaha rajiha a a great maslaha so we know a matter is going to get us towards harm, then we have to stop it. If there is not in opposition to it, like in Maslaha Rajiha. And this Qa'idah is from the Qawaid which that the scholars differ on. It's from the Qawaid which what? It's from the Qawaid which the ulama differed upon. It's from the Qawaid which the Ahlul Ilmi differed upon and their way of observing it has become uh, different. <clears throat> so every means that reaches to mafsada, corruption and harm, then what we should do is what? We should stop it. And we spoke about this matter, this matter, when we were speaking about the issue of the issue when we were speaking about al-nahiyu, if the prohibition is ida kana sadd sadd if this prohibition came because it's going to lead to a harm, ubihalil maslahat al-rajha, it's permitted if there's a greater good in it. The haram is the the haram is how many types? I mean, the nahi is how many types? Ma hurri that which has been made haram in and within itself. So it's haram what? In and within itself. And it's haram which is what? Haram which is sadda li It's been made haram because of what it's going to lead to. Not that it's haram in and within itself, but it's going to lead to something that's haram. The first one, it's haram lidati, so you don't look at sadda li Because the thing is haram in and within itself. The only time that we look at the issue of sadda li is what? When the thing itself doesn't have the ruling independently. Its ruling is connected to what? To what it's going to lead to. In this particular situation, if there comes a maslaha rajiha, that a greater good is seen, then it's permitted. A mithal for this is, is a man allowed to look at a woman? Looking at a woman is a nahyun, is a prohibition. For what reason? Because it's going to lead to what? A harm. What is it that it's going to lead to? Zina. 
So the Sharia, what did it do? It prohibited it and it prevented it. Because it's going to lead to what? Because it's going to lead to that which is? To that which is haram. Lakin, a maslaha rajiha came, meaning the harm now is outweighed by a maslaha which is greater than it. Which is what? A individual now wants to marry this woman. <coughs> he wants to get married to the same woman that he wasn't allowed to look at. In this particular situation, from a situation to another situation, he hasn't become her husband, he's not her brother. It's in one sit, it can be permissible, permissible and in that same sit, it can be impermissible. Why is it permissible at one moment and not, not, not to the other? It's because now there's a maslaha rajaha. It's a great maslaha. The Sharia wants to attain. When Sheikh Al-Sam Taymiyyah, he says, وَمَا كَانَ مَنْ عَنْهُ لِسَدِّ الذَّرِيعَةِ If something is prohibited because it's going to lead to harm, لَا لِأَنَّهُ مَفْسَدَ Not because it's a corruption, not because it's a harm. فِي نَفْسِ إِنَا وَذِنْ itself, يُشْرَعُ إِذَا كَانَ فِيهِ مَصْلَحَ رَاجِحَةً That thing gets legislated and permitted if there's a greater good. وَلَا تُفَوَّتُ الْمَصْلَحَةَ الرَّاجِحَةً لِغَيْرِ مَفْسَدَةً الرَّاجِحَةً And a maslaha rajiha is not abandoned and left for other than a mafsada rajiha. A mafsada rajiha. The scholars, they distinguish between what is known as saddu dharai' and what al-wasail means. Okay, scholars, they distinguish between it. What does sadd al-dhari'a and wasila, are they the same? The scholars, they distinguish between it. And from the scholars that distinguish between it is, is the great Maliki scholar, Al-Imam Al-Qarafi, rahimahullah. He has a kitab called Al-Furuq. He has a book called Al-Furuq. And in this book of his, he gives time and effort towards terms that are used by the Usuriyin and the Fuqaha that need to be distinguished one from the other. They may have some similarities. So what he does is that he gives it differences. Especially when those furuq are furuq daqiqa, if they especially, if the similarities are very very close, he comes and he distinguishes one from the other, and he mentions where, reasons why they are what makes them different. The difference he mentions is that the prohibition of the means is different from the prohibitions of the daraya. Why? Because the prohibitions of the means. أن تحريم الوسائل فيما يقطع بإفضائه إلى الفساد. The means we can clearly say that it's going to lead to haram, 100%. The means when it leads to haram, we can say definitely this is going to lead to corruption. As for the ضرائع فإنه لا يجزم بإفضائه إلى الفساد. We can't say 100% that's what's going to take place. It's based upon what ما يخشى من ذلك. What we fear that might come from this. So when we have a wavering conviction in a matter, then this is a wasila. But if we have speculation and assumption, then it becomes what? A dharaya. It becomes dharaya. The second difference that he mentions is that the tahrim al wasail, the tahrim of the the wasail, yujal hukm al wasila fi dhatiha tahrim. The wasila. It takes the prohibition of the thing that it's going to lead to. The wasila, if it's going to lead to haram, it becomes haram itself. It becomes haram, haram itself. As for the dharai, on the other hand, we will never say that the dhari'ah is haram. We say it's mubah. But in this situation, it's become what? For this, it's mubah. No one's denying that it's mubah. But it's leading to something which is mamnu'ah, so you're not allowed to do it. But the dari'ah is a what? The dari'ah is mubah, that has been prohibited for that particular moment. You're not allowed to do that ibaha. Because of what? لَأَنَّا تُؤَدِّي إِلَى مَمْنُوعِ شَرْعًا Whereas the wasila, it is haram. It's haram. So that's the distinguishing factor that mentions it. Also, there's another term that's always confused when it comes to the ra'i, which is hiyal. Hiyal. Hiyal and the ra'i are two things that are mainly conflated with one another, or they're confused with one another. The first one is the ra'i, 
And is that, that's the one we're talking about. And the second one is what? Al Hiyal. Hiyal. What are the differences between the two? Hiyal is when a person, like the people of the Sabbath, what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say about them? They were prohibited from um, going out and fishing. So what did they do? They put nets out. That's hiyal. That's a hiyal. A man divorces his wife three times. The talaq finishes. He does what is known as halala, as they call it. Huh? This is hiyal. It's not permissible. It is not. It's not. It is not permissible. It's called hiyal. So what's the difference between dara'i and hiyal? Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah distinguishes between saddu dara'i and hiyal bi amrayni. Two ways that he says that they're different. The first one is min jihati qasd al-fa'ili. The one who's doing it, the intention he comes with. The hiyal is actually an intention that the person intended to reach the haram. The person is intending it. As for the saddu dara'i, the person is not intention, he's not intending haram. But his action may lead to haram. But he's not, he's, that's not his motive and intention. So that's one angle Ibn Taymiyyah says is different. The one who is doing it is intention. And the second angle is, Ibn Taymiyyah said it's different, is the path in which it's taken. The path which it's, the path in which it's taken. Which is hiyal, is more broader than the ra'ya. The hila can possibly be the ra'ya. And it can also be other than it. It can be other than it. So the path, one is more general than the other. So Shaykh al-Islam al has a kitab on this whole issue, which is called Bayan al-Dalil fi butlan al-Tahleel. Bayan al-Dalil في بطلان التحرير وهي تكس about the issue of حيل when the sharia prohibits you from something you try to come from another angle you come from another angle in order to open a path for yourself and he wrote this book specifically for the, the one I mentioned which is a man who divorces his wife بينونة الكبرى the divorce where he finishes all the all, the, all of it Three times he divorces her. And now he wants to take his wife back. The thing that the people do, which is that they try to bring a man to marry his wife, and then he takes his wife back. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah wrote a kitab on this. That what these two people are doing is zina. Even if he marries her with the permission of her wali and everything, and she's consented to it, that this man and this woman, because what they're trying to do, it's to legislate it. For another man, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he says is what? Is zina. And when she goes back to her, because now she thinks that she's married another man, and she can go back to her husband. When she goes back to her second husband, or the ex-husband, she's doing zina with him as well. Shaykh Hussam Taymiyyah proves that. It's all zina that's being done here. Nothing has the Sharia taken into consideration. Lakin, Ibn Taymiyyah mentions that if the woman Rahimahullah mentions, if this is when they both agree on this issue, the husband and the wife come together and they both agree on it. This man and this woman say, look, uh, you know, I've divorced you three, the talaq has finished, I want to take you back. She's like, yeah, I want to come back to you. Uh, he goes to, okay, you know what, go marry and come back to me. And she <coughs> does that and she comes back to him. And she what? She comes back to him. Shaykh al-Islam al says, this is a but if the wife does it on her own intention, and it's not an agreed point by bet between the two individuals, the husband and the wife haven't agreed. The wife just came with this thought herself. She is only doing this to go back to her ex-husband. He says, this is not what the hadith is talking about. That the Prophet mm -hmm. prohibited this issue. He says, it's not referring to this. It's not referring to this. <laughs> Rahimahullah ta'ala. Not to mention, if it happens, which some situations have happened, where she, he says to her, okay, go get married to another man. And then she goes and she gets married to another man. In the, with the intention of what? Coming back to who what? Her ex-husband. If she then changes her mind and says, you know what? I'm not going to come back to you. I'm going to stay with this man. She's with him in zina. 
She's with this man in what? In zina until she what? Until she gets married to him. So she has to get married to him if she wants to be with him. What's the evidence for this principle? This issue, the qa'idah that we mentioned here, is the statement of Allah, وَلَا تَصُبُّ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ فَيَصُبُّ اللَّهَ عَدْوًا بِغَيْرِ عِلْمٍ Allah says, do not insult those who are calling to other than Allah. Don't insult the disbelievers. Uh, don't insult the idols, don't say the religion, don't do that. Why? Because فَيَصُبُّ اللَّهَ عَدْوًا بِغَيْرِ عِلْمٍ They will what? They will insult Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. So, حُرِّمَ سَبُّ الْآلِهَا مَعَنَّهُ عِبَادَةِ Pay attention to this. Insulting their gods has been prohibited, even though it's a what? It's a ibadah. It's prohibited. Why? لِكَوْنِهِ ذَرِيعَةِ Because it's a means to what? إِلَى سَبِّهِمُ اللَّهِ That they're going to insult who? That they're going to insult Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the maslaha is in leaving, insulting uh, their gods. Why? Because they're going to insult Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then this is maslaha rajiha. This is a what? Maslaha rajiha. Also the hadith of the Prophet when the fact that the Prophet with him was what? Munafiqeen, hypocrites. And he never killed them. He let them be. Why didn't he kill them? He said, لا يتحدث الناس I don't want the people to talk about أنه أن محمد يقتل أصحابه That Muhammad kills his companions. That's what they're going to say. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he left killing the hypocrites, knowing that they're in his, in his what? In his midst. They're with him. They're everywhere he goes, they're with him. He knows their names, some of them. But he doesn't expose them, number one. And number two, he doesn't what? He doesn't kill them, alayhi salatu wasalam. Ma'a kawnihi maslaha. Even though there is a benefit in killing them. But the greater maslaha is what? The greater maslaha is that he what? He leaves it. Why? Because if he doesn't, it's a dhari'ah, it's a part for the people to say, Inna Muhammad yaqtul ashabahu, that Muhammad is going to kill, Muhammad kills his companions. After he killed everyone, he's a bloodthirsty individual. What did he do? What did he do? He now is coming to his own followers, and now he's killing his own followers. That's what they're going to say. That's there, is what he's going to say. The people are going to say. Also the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar, that the Prophet, he prohibited praying when the sun is rising and when the sun sets. The Prophet mm -hmm. prohibited it. Even though this is a ibadah, even though the maqsid and the intention in which you're doing it is who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But because this is going to lead to what? Dhari'ah. It is going to lead and yu'ti ba'd ahkamih that you're going to give some of the rulings are going to be given to what? The, the sun. Because the sun is going to gain that prostration with it as well. Is it not? It will. So this is what's going to lead to. So because of that, it's prohibited. Or it's going to lead to imitating the kuffar and becoming a person who's like them. Shaykh Ulama mentioned those two different dara'ya that it comes to. <clears throat> so how does this principle, how does this principle apply to our issue at hand? The way that it applies to us is that the Imam, the, the, the Da'i who's giving da'wah ila Allah wa ta'ala, he learns what? That which is manhiyu anhu, that which is prohibited, lidati in and within itself, or that which is prohibited what? Sadda lidari'ah. He learns the difference between them two. So he knows which one is he able to use based on maslaha rajiha or not. He will know that. Sahih? And which circumstances can he say that this prohibition is not lidatihi, it is what? Huh? Or when it's not nahyun, nahyun lidati. When it is nahyun lidati and when it's not. For example, teaching females. Which one does it fall under? It's haram because if it, can, it, it can lead to what? Zina. It can lead to it. Like in ubiha, it is permitted when it's what? When there's a maslaha rajiha. When there's a what? Maslaha rajiha, it's now permitted. So the person who's giving da'wah, when he answers the questions, he bases it on those principles and he looks at it. Also, this teaches us what? Um, mixing and sitting with um, Ahlul Bid'ah, the people of innovation, and spending time with them 
it's also from those things which are it is prohibited nahyun a prohibition because it's going to lead to harm their, their bid'ah is going to spread they're going to think that they're going to think that they're upon the haq and the truth so it's being prohibited of what it's going to lead like an the maslah al-rajiha for you to sit with them for you to advise them for you to bring them back from their innovation will be a high permissible you're allowed to sit with them if what you're bringing about is a maslah al-rajiha if there so when you see a da'i who's sitting with a mubtadi straight away you don't say oh mashallah he works with the mubtadi'ah what do you say maybe he's sitting with them because he sees it to be what that the maslah al-rajiha that there's a greater good in what in sitting with them um, this also teaches us when you're addressing a people to address them in the language that they understand and that's not a problem and it's not disliked speak to them as long as it's what as long as it's not done with terms in which the sharia are prohibited maslaha raj so you're talking to the youths and the youngsters to speak to them in the way that they understand and they can relate to is jaiz Bishart with the condition that what you're saying and the way that you're talking to them is not it is not something that's going to be vulgar in your statements you can't say vulgar stuff and things that are foul which the sharia are prohibited also it is permissible for the da'i to read the books of the disbelievers and to go over them so that he could know what so he can give da'wah to them when he's talking to them because of maslaha rajiha um, and matters like that al qaidatu at tasi'ah the ninth qaida that we're going to go through is al-i'tisam bil jama'ah holding on to the jama'ah wal i'tilaf and to unite is from the fundamental things of our religion min usul al-din from the fundamentals of our religion Unity is from the fundamental issues of our religion. But which type, which type of unity? Fi deenillah in the religion of Allah. To unite upon what? In the religion of who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does it mean? al bil jama'ah. What does jama'ah actually mean? This term jama'ah comes a lot. And Imam al-Shatibi mentions that the word jama'ah, it means five things. We're not going to go now in details, we'll leave it for another time. He says the first one is Sawadul A'zam. The first one he mentions is what? Sawadul A'zam. Okay? It means the body of believers. The second one is Jama'atu A'immatil Ulama Il Mujtahideen. It means the Ulama, the Fuqaha, the jurists who've reached the level of Ijtihad, the, the scholars. That's what it means. It means the ulama in mujtahideen. That's what he's talking about. The third one is the sahaba ta'ala al khusus. It's only talking about the sahabas. That's the third view. The fourth one is jama'at ahli al Islam. It means the jama'ah of the Muslims. And number five is what? Jama'at al Muslimin ida jtama'u ala amrin. If the Muslims unite upon a matter. If the Muslims unite upon a. If they unite upon a matter. Al Imam al Shatibiyu. He looked at all of those aqwal and he said the murad that's meant by jama'ah is it's ahlul ilmi wal ijtihad. He says that's what it means. It's people of knowledge and ijtihad. If the awamun nasi are added to them, no problem. It's not an issue. Lakin the ulama can't be out of the equation. The ulama and the mujtahideen are not taken out of the equation. They are number one, the jama'ah. So when we say al-i'tisam bil jama'ah, it means ahlul ilmi wal ijtihad, the people of. al shatibi rahimahullah, he mentions this in his kitab, al-i'tisam, the second volume, page 776, that the qawl which is sahih in this issue is that it's meant by huwa sawadu al-a'zam min ahli al-ilmi wal ijtihad. This qa'idah is very vital, which is that the person would know the weight that he has when it comes to unity and how Islam observes unity and the importance that unity holds and that the Ummah should unite but what is it that they unite upon? they unite upon two things 
شيخ الإسلام ابن تيمة السائل وأهل السنة والحديث أعظم الناس اتفاقا وائتلافا ابن تيمة السائل that the people of the sunnah the people of hadith are the greatest people who unite وكل من, وكل من كان من الطوائف every single group every single group that are out there the closer they are to Ahl sunnah the more they have unity amongst themselves and the more that they're distanced from Ahl sunnah the more that they are what? the more they have less unity فالمعتزله for example he says the mu'tazila akthar ittifaqan wa ittilafan min al-mutafalsifa the mu'tazila have more unity than the the philosopher, the philosophers. And the kullabi and the karami and the sha'ira, which are all called the mutakallimin. They called what? The kullabi and the karami and the sha'ira, all called what? They are called the mutakallimin, ahlul kalam. Those three have more unity than the mu'tazila. Look what the Shaykh al Islam Taymiyyah then says. Where well, you're not going to find, he said, ittifaqan wa ittilafan. You're not going to find unity and coming together except through following ittiba'u athari al-anbiya'i min al-Qur'an wal hadith Following the prophetic way, the Qur'an and the Sunnah, following those two. That's what he said is going to bring the people together. وَلِذَلِكَ When the scholars called it Ahl sunnah what did they say? Ahl sunnah wal jamaa Meaning they are the people of the Sunnah first. So they came together on the Sunnah, and then look what he said after that. Well, Jama'ah, they united upon it. They what? They united. And Allah says in the Quran, وَاَعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا Allah says, unite upon what? On the rope of Allah. And the ulama, they gave many meanings of what's meant by it. But that shows you that unity that says, you be, what, be upon whatever you want. You be upon whatever you want. You be upon whatever you want. And you be upon whatever you want. And we will just have one name that brings us all together. This is not the unity that the Quran and the Sunnah are speaking about. Because what does the Quran want? The Quran wants you to be in line with it and the Sunnah. And you the same, and you the same, and you the same. Because what you've now done is you've just, from the outer, you've made it seem there's unity. But each person has his own belief. And Allah did not praise that. What Allah praised is the one that they all have the same creed and the same, they unite upon the same fundamental matters of the religion. That's what Allah, when He spoke about the Jews, what did He say about them? From the outer, you think that they're together. But their hearts are all over the place. Each one has his own belief. What is it that Allah wants people to come together on? In their hearts. That's what the Quran wants. Because if that was praiseworthy, that you physically become united, but your heart can be different, then Allah would not have spoken against the Jews like that. And He would not have scolded them. And He would not have rebuked them for this action. Would He have? That shows that the unity that's looked for is the qalb, the people's hearts coming together. And what is it that can bring the people's hearts together is when they follow what? The Quran and the, the Sunnah. The Quran and the Sunnah. That being said, that being said, what is it that the religion wants us to unite upon? That we all come together on. It wants us to come upon, on, on together with what? The Quran and the Sunnah. But the Quran and the Sunnah consists consist of it. Ahkam al sharia al talabiyya and al ahkam al sharia al khabariya. The Quran and the Sunnah hold matters which are fiqh related and masail which are what? Aqeedah related. The scholars, they say, anything that has a nas, whether it be from aqeedah or whether it even be from fiqh, it doesn't matter. If there's a textual evidence for it, when we say textual evidence, we mean the Quran and the Sunnah. Or there's a consensus in this issue, unity has to be found in that because the Quran has already spoken, the Sunnah has spoken in this issue, and also what? There's a consensus in this particular issue, unity has to come in this. Like in anything that doesn't have nas, it doesn't have kitab or sunnah, and it also doesn't have what? Or in in this issue. It is from the issues that we can physically unite even though we differ on it. We can physically unite even though we have difference in it. 
Why? Because it's from the Masail which there are no textual evidence for it, or there's, no, or there's no consent in it. When you conflate that two, and you mix the two, you start to go wrong in everything. Walidarika, the small scholars, what do they do? They divide the khilaf into two. It's one is what? Khilaf which, which is Mahmud, a praiseworthy khilaf. What is the khilaf which is Mahmud? Is the khilaf that happens, laysa fiha nas, there's no textual evidence. Wala ijma' there is no what? There is no consent in it. Walil ijtihad fiha majal. And there can be ijtihad in this issue. There can be what? There can be ijtihad in this matter. And I'm not going to go into too much details in this regard because that's going to be another qa'ida by itself. The second one is khilaf which is madhmum, the khilaf which the sharia rebuked and spoke against. And this is what? The one that goes against what? It goes against the nas. It goes against the Quran. Nas means Quran and Sunnah. Or it goes against ijma'ul ummah, the, the, uh, the consensus of the ummah. The consensus of the ummah is not there. And this khilaf, which is madhmum, has maratib, as Shaykh al Taymi mentions, it has levels. The first one is mukhalafat al kuffari lil mu'minina fi aqa'idihim. The khilaf between the Muslims and the disbelievers in belief. The khilaf that Muslims have with the disbelievers, that's the greatest one. The khilaf we have with them in aqidah, the khilaf that we have with them, with them in ibadat, the khilaf that we have with them in mu'amalat, transactions. Are we together? So we have khilaf with the disbelievers in what? We have it in two things. What are the two things? Ahkam al shariyah al khabariyah aqidah. We have khilaf with the disbelievers in this. Sahih? And we also have khilaf with the disbelievers in what? Al ahkam al shariyah al talabiyah, which is fiqh. We have khilaf with them in it. And the fiqh is how many times? Two times. Ibadat and mu'amalat. We have khilaf with them in ibadat and we have, uh, we have khilaf with them in mu'amalat, transactions and whatnot. They've opposed us in this. This type of khilaf is what? It's aqbahu al khilaf wa ashba'u. It's the greatest form of khilaf and the worst of khilaf. The disbelievers, this is the sajiyat al kufar. This is the way of the kufar, which is fa'inum da'imu al mukhalafat lil mu'minin. They always want to go against the believers. Number two is khilaf al ahli al bid'ah wal ahwa al ahli sunnah wal jama'ah. The second type is the khilaf of the innovators, the people of desires that they oppose who? Who do they oppose? Ahl Sunnah, the Khilaf of Ahl Bida, towards Ahl Sunnah. Because their Khilaf with Ahl Sunnah is what? Is in the issue of the what? The issue of the Sunnah. The Khilaf of Ahl Sunnah, the Ahl Bida have with Ahl Sunnah, is the Mas'ala of what? The following of the Sunnah of the Prophet. This is where the Khilaf with them is. Because they are Mubtadi'ah, they fell and they opposed the Prophet's way. They've paved a path other than that for themselves. And they do fall under the statement of Allah, وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ تَفَرَّقُوا وَاخْتَلَفُوا مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَهُمُ الْبَيِّنَاتِ This ayah means a mubtadi'ah. وَلَا تَكُونُوا and do not be like who? كَالَّذِينَ تَفَرَّقُوا Those who've become disunited. <coughs> disunited. وَاخْتَلَفُوا and they differed. مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَهُمُ الْبَيِّنَاتِ When clear-cut evidence came to them. Clear comes, ayat came, Quran came, Sunnah came, and they disunited. Don't be like those people. The third type of khilaf which is madmum is the khilaf which happens from the ulama. The ulama come with this one. And this one is called min ara, the opinions that the scholars hold, which goes against what? To khalifu nasan or ijma'a. What does it oppose? What does it go against? It either, either goes against the nas. A textual evidence which is the Quran and the Sunnah, or it goes against Ijma, consents. Are we all together? This is what the scholars call Zallatul Alim. This is what's called Zallatul Alim, when the scholar slips and he does a mistake. This one, in reality, is from the Khilaf which is Madmum. It's Khilaf which is Madmum. Why? Because he went against, against, he went against a textual evidence. He went against Ijma of the Ummah in this issue. Are we all together? This one is khilaf, which is madmum. Don't ever think to yourself, Shaykh Hussam Taibi elaborates on this on more than 20 places in this, more than 20 places. 
That don't ever think to yourself that a khilaf cannot be madmum because the one who said it is muta'awwil. He's got an interpretation for it. Does that make sense? This alim has an interpretation. He has his own reasoning. That doesn't still take it out of it being khilaf, which is madmum. Why? Because he went against the textual evidence. Because he went against what? Because he went against I'll give an example. Ibn Abi Dhu'ayb, Ibn Abi Dhu'ayb, sorry, Ibn Abi Dhu'ayb, he had that Malik Ibn Anasim prohibited Khiyar al-Majlis when it comes to Bayah. That the person has a Khiyar al-Majlis where he can come back from the Bayah, where he can leave the Bayah and say, I don't want it. He's a time frame where, where he's sitting there, he can leave them. Malik didn't accept that. This hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim, it's in Sahihain. And who Malik is going against it? Ibn Abi Dhib, what did he say? He said, Malik wa illa duriba unuku. He said, Malik is told to repent from this or his neck is going to be stricken. Shadid, right? And then Ahmed, rahimahullah, what did he say on this particular issue? Ahmed, rahimahullah, said this dahabi, but he said, Ala minu bala. Ahmed said in this particular issue, rahimahullah, Ahmed said this, that he said, Ibn Abi Dhib is right and he's more wiser in this particular situation. And then, of course, dahabi refutes all of them. And he goes, this is not right, Malik is an Imam and what not. But the point here right now is that even if the Imam is Mujtahid and he's an Alim, even then it doesn't take it out of it being what? Khilaf which is? Khilaf which is Madmum. When did Al Imam, sorry, when did Abu Huraira and Ibn Abbas discuss the issue? And then Ibn Abbas said, let me give you an example. And he said, Fala tadri I told you Allah and his messenger said, and you're going to give me an example? فَلَا تَضْرِبُوا لِلَّهِ الْأَمْثَالِ Don't give a parable to Allah and His Messenger. Ah. Because this is khilaf which is بدمو. Even though it's coming from who? Abdullah ibn Abbas, the noble companion. So pay attention to this issue. Ibn al-Qaytaymiyyah rahimahullah elaborates on this issue very highly. The unity of the Muslims will happen. The Muslims will come together. And they will unite. When will they unite? There are asbab. There are ways Allah legislated for the Muslims to unite. We should not make our own path and set our own ways. The way that it should be done is set. It's set by Allah. The Quran and the Sunnah have shown this. Number one is al-amalu bid-dini kamilan. The whole religion has to be implemented. Wal qiyamu and to stand up bima amar Allah bihi zahiran wa batinan. That internally and externally, the person internally and externally he what he implements the deen of Allah. Lakin if we become like those who Allah says. أَفَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِبَعْضِ الْكِتَابِ وَتَكْفُرُونَ بِبَعْضِ That we take some of the Qur'an and the Sunnah and we reject the rest. Then the other party is going to hold on to the other side. And we're going to hold on to the other side. And this unity will always stand. وَلِذَلِكَ Pay attention. Why was the unity more at the time of the companions? Because they came with this one more than us. They came into the religion wholeheartedly. Allah instructed us to do that. What did He say? أُدُخُلُوا Today our du'at who are giving da'wah, they don't make the people come into the religion wholeheartedly so unity can come. What do they do? They just say, be the way that you are, let's just unite. That is in opposition to the Quran and the Sunnah. And it's also in opposition to what? To the ijma' of the ulama. The consensus that the ummah have, have on this issue. Look what he said, Ali Shaykh al-Islam al he said, فَظَهَرَ what is apparent and the سَبَبَ الْإِجْتِمَاعِ وَالْأُلْفَةِ To come together, to unite, to be together, is what? Is جَبْعُ الدِّينِ To bring the whole religion together. For us to unite, means the un it means the taking of the religion in its totality. وَالْعَمَلُ بِي كُلُّ And the whole religion is what? Implemented. And then look what he says, وَهُوَ عِبَادَةُ اللَّهِ وَحَدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ Allah is worshipped alone and it is not associated with partners with him. كَمَا أَمَرَ بِهِ As Allah commanded, بَاطِلًا وَظَاهِرًا If that is done, then the unity will occur. It will come. Number two is الْأَمْرُ بِالْمَعْرُوفُ وَالنَّهِ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرُ وَالتَّلَاصُحُ بَيْنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Calling each other to the good, prohibiting each other from the evil, and advising one another is what brings unity. People are going to say to you what? أَخِي, you know what? Be quiet. Don't say this. Don't speak about this issue. Bury it. Don't talk about it. That's actually what's going to bring what? Division. Ah. What does it bring? Division. How many people say, how many people say, Wallahi, and nobody's ever told me this. Yesterday, yesterday, the Uber driver that I took, that I was in his car, he asked me about the ruling of combining all of the prayers. 
And I told him, no, this is not permissible. He goes, when I go home, I combine all the prayers. I said, this is wrong. This is not permissible for you to do. There is, and he looked at me and he said to me, every sheikh I've ever asked, because he's a Hanafi, he said, that's what they told me. And I explained it to him and he said, it makes sense now. And he said, you know what, I'm not going to do that again. So when you call the people to the good, and you tell them what it is, when you tell them as it is, with wisdom, with watching how you speak to them, when you're addressing them, you know how you're talking. But you tell the people the truth. And you tell them what is right from what is wrong. And you advise them kindly and generously. What happens? You bring the people to the religion and then unity comes. What happens? Unity comes. Now look what happened. That man, I said to him, are you an Uber driver? He said, the problem is, is when I drive, sometimes sometime I take a person and then Salah comes in. And then I'm in the road for a long time and the Salah goes. What shall I do? I said, now... From now on, an hour before the Salah time, don't take anyone. 45 minutes, half an hour before the Salah, an hour, stop taking people, just switch off your thing. Go to the local masjid. He said, I'll do that. Jazakallah khairan. Now what, we, what have we done? We've united him with the Jama'at al-Muslimin. He's going to pray with the Muslims now. So unity comes with Al-Amru bil-Ma'ruf wa nahi anil munkar wa tanawsu bayn al-Mu'mineen that we advise each other. We tell each other the truth and what is right from what is wrong. And there are many other reasons. Number three, uh, sorry, number, the point I will now move on to is what brings about disunity. What is it that brings about disunity? There are many things. The first one, of course, is what we mentioned opposite to what we mentioned in the previous point, which is Something Allah and His Messenger commanded the people leave it. Whether it be ibadat or whether it be other issues. A matter from the religion is left and it brings disunity. It's been abandoned. The people are not doing it. The second thing that brings it about is having this fanaticism towards a particular individual or a land or a method or a, a, a school of thought that you follow. Uh, and you base what? Particular on this particular shaykh, Shaykh Fulan ibn Fulan, you base love and hate on him. Wallahi, you do, and you call it nice names. But this is what you're doing. You have al wala and al bara you place love. And hate on a shaykh who's from the maybe from the scholars of the Sunnah, but you base hate, hate, and, hate and love on it. Like, for example, the person who says Abu Hanifa, for instance, if you're not Hanafi, I don't shake your hand and I will not talk to you. Abu Hanifa is a what? He's an imam from the ulama of Ahl Sunnah. Ba'dalika, basing love and hate on him is what? Brings disunity. Or basing what? Love and hate on a land. Isn't that what brings you disunity? You say, we're from these people, we don't, cut, we don't mix with these people. Love and hate is based upon that. Love is what? It's based on that. The third one is Oppression that is done. Somebody is oppressing a people, whether it be speech or whether it be action, he's bringing oppression to the table. He's unjustly allegations and kalam against a person's ird, his honor. He's oppressing a person. What is he doing? <coughs> He's, on a, he's oppressing an individual. And so since he's oppressing this individual, unity can't come. Unity can't come. Because this person feels oppressed. The fourth one is Tarkul Amri bil Ma'rufi wa Nahi Anil Munkar. The calling to the good and prohibiting the evil is what's missing. It's abandoned, it's left. No one is calling to the good and no one's prohibiting the evil. Uh, or Al Amr bil Ma'ruf wa Nahi Anil Munkar is done in what? Bighayr Tariq al Shara'iyyin. It's taken a method being taken other than the way that it's legislated. Unity doesn't come through it. Why? Because if you call the people to good or you prohibit them from evil, but the way that you're doing it is not legislated by Allah and His Messenger, it has no thabarah. It means about no benefit. So wujuduhu ka'adamu. Its presence is like its absence. The second, the fifth thing that brings this unity is what? المجادلة في الدين بضرب بعضه بعض. What you do is you argue in the religion by taking some of it to smack it against the other parts of the religion. So you take part of the religion to use it against the other part of the religion, as the أهل الأهواء والبدع they do. ولذلك when the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم saw the companions discussing the issue of قدر in his gathering, the Prophet got angry. And then he said to them, are you going to take some of the Qur'an and the Sunnah and use it against the other part? So he prohibited them it. He prohibited them from this, alayhi salatu 
Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah mentions the natija, the benefit that comes from unity. He says that the unity, the Muslims coming together, the benefits that comes is number one, Allah is pleased with them. Allah's salutation comes down. Sa'ada to dunya wal akhirah, happiness in this world and the hereafter comes from it. Because this unity, what does it bring? People make each other face agony and pain. Like unity, what does it bring? Sa'ada to dunya wal akhirah. It also brings what? The faces shine. Because Allah said in the Quran, Whose faces are the ones who's going to shine? Ahl Sunnah. Who's the ones whose faces are going to be darkened? The people of innovation. So the people of innovation are people of disunity. They're what? People of disunity. The, the opposite, which is furqah, disunity. What, 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 what comes out from it? Allah. Allah's punishment comes from it. Allah curse comes down on it. The people also lose out what? The people lose out from receiving, sorry, the faces are darkened. No, the people won't get whitened face, darkened face that day. The messenger frees himself from them. In the hadith of Umm Salama, what did she say? Allah freed the messenger وسلم, from those who disunite. The people upon this unity, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he freed himself and he's freed his messenger from them. What's the evidence for this qa'idah? The statement of Allah, وَاَعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا What did Al-Imam Ibn Taymiyyah say? He said in this ayah, فَاللَّهُ تَعَالَى قَدْ أَمَرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Allah commanded the believers, all of them, اَيَعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِهِ That they hold onto his rope. Jami'an together, wala yatafarraqu, and that they do not disunite on it. <coughs> also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, Inna al-ladheena farraqu deenahum wa kanu shi'an lasta minhum fi shay. Inna al-ladheena the ones, farraqu deenahum disunited in their religion, lasta minhum fi shay, and you have nothing to do with them, Muhammad. They are free from you, and you're free from them. The ayah has two recitations and two qira'ah in which it's read. One is, Inna al-ladheena فَرَّقُوا دِينَهُمْ And Ibn Jarir al-Tabari you said, when it's إِنَّ الَّذِينَ فَرَّقُوا When it's فَرَّقُوا He said it's talking about the disunity that occurs between Ahl sunnah and the Ahl al-Bid'ah. That's what it is, he said. But when the recitation is إِنَّ الَّذِينَ فَرَّقُوا دِينَهُمْ And that qira'ah is read فَرَّقُوا It means the disunity that occurs between what? The believers and the non-believers. The believers and the non-believers. And that's how he, recess, that's how he settles between it. Allah says in another ayah, وَلَوْ شَاءَ رَبُّكَ If your Lord willed, لَجَعَلَ النَّاسَ أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا Allah would have made the people all unite. If Allah wanted, He would have made all of the people come together. وَلَا يَزَالُونَ مُخْتَلِفِينَ The people will remain disunited. إِلَّا مَنْ رَحِمَ رَبُّكَ Except those who Allah has mercy upon them. This ayah, Allah rebukes ikhtilaf. And Allah rebukes what? Its people. He rebukes it subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah mentioned two distinct characteristics in this verse for khilaf, disunity. Two characteristics that are clear in the verse. The first one is that their khilaf is consistent forever. The second thing that he mentioned for them is annahum khalaful mu'minina that they oppose the believers. So when the people oppose the believers, whether it be in issues of mu'taqadat, or whether it be in qadaya, which are what? In ibadat or mu'amalat, this is what happens. Their disunity is forever. They will always be. What is it that we take from this qa'idah? How does it apply to da'wah in Allah Ta'ala? The way that it does is, la yajuzu, it is not permissible. That a person claims that a person claims لا يجوز أن يدعي أحد في أصول الدين إلى مذهب معين It is not permissible when it comes to issues which are توحيد العقيدة for you to call the people to a particular individual and the Sunnah never called people when it comes to عقيدة to a particular individual we follow Imam Malik or Imam Hanif or Shafi' al-Ahmed in Masail which are أحكام الشرعية الطلبية like we don't follow them in Masail أحكام الشرعية الخبرية even though they are all in the same in that Meaning there is no 
You can't say I'm on the aqeed of Imam Shafi'i because that will entitle and that will mean that Imam Malik is upon a different aqeedah and that's not the case. Because if you follow Shafi'i al-aqeedah, then that means you follow Malik al-aqeedah and Ahmed al-aqeedah, rahimahumullah. But that's why an Imam Ibn Taymiyyah in Islamia, what does he say at the ending? وَهَذَا اَعْتِقَادُ الشَّافِعِيِّ وَمَالِكٌ وَأَبِي حَنِيفَةَ ثُمَّ أَحْمَدُ يُنْقَلُوا This is the aqeed of all of them. Ah, it's nothing disunic. وَلِذَلِكَ شَيْخُ الْإِسْلَامِ بْنُ تَيْمِعَ When he had the munadara on aqeedat al-wasatiyya, when he had the debate, and the leader wanted to bring reconciliation between him and the other groups, the leader wanted to let them leave Ibn Taymiyyah alone. And he wanted them to stop pestering him and giving him hard time. Ibn Taymiyyah said to, the leader said to Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Taymiyyah, say to them, this is the aqeed of Ahmed. And then you guys are upon another fiqh, you're Shafi'i, you're Hanbali, you're Maliki, then this is your aqeed, no problem. Say that to them. And Ibn Taymiyyah said, Allah. Wallahi ma'aqeedah is the aqeed of the Adma. This is wallahi not khas to Ahmed, rahimahullah. And it's not specific to him. Are we all together? So when we call to usul al deed we don't say we're following Imam Fulan ibn Fulan. Our Prophet ﷺ is for us in this issue. Are we together? Also, it is not permissible an yukaffara ahad that a takfir is placed on a person min al muslimina or yufasak or tafsiq or we say Fulan is a fasiq or we say he's a mubtadi' illa ila ulima unless it's known and no qad qamat ali al hujja unless we know that the proof has been established on him. وَانْتَفَتِ الْمَحَجَّةِ And whatever obstacle that was there is removed from him. Also this qa'idah, what does it teach us? That the tanazu' fi al-masail alati yasugu fiha al-ijtihad The masail which there are differences and the differences in these masail are valid, meaning there's none of us have textual evidence for it. Pay attention to this. It, it, we're going to speak about it later, inshallah, ta'ala, if we have time for it. Which is khilaf and ijtihad are what, brothers? We always mention this. Are they different or are they the same? Ya ikhwa, khilaf and ijtihad are not the same. Ibn al-Qayyim mentions this in his I'lam, rahimahullah. And we're going to bring it later, inshallah, ta'ala. That there's a difference between... And Ibn, Ibn al-Qayyim refutes the statement of those who say, La inkara fi masail al-khilaf. He refutes that and he says that's wrong. Because khilaf can be in matters which there are what? There's a nas and the textual evidence. For example, nikah al muta Is it a khilaf or is it a ijtihad issue? It's a khilafi issue. How is it a khilafi? Like Ibn Abbas, we have qawla, he said something like this. Are we all together? Like it is not, it's not an ijtihad. Why is it not an ijtihad? Because khilaf, it means that there's an opposition of one party to a textual evidence. Are we all together? Like an ijtihad means not, there's no opposition to a textual evidence, or there's no opposition to ijma'ah. Are we all together? <coughs> Ijtihad means no one is going against a textual evidence, or no one is going against ijma'ah, <coughs> consent. Am I making sense here? Like in khilaf, so a group of party, a, a group of party might be going against a what? A textual evidence. Qala Allah, qala Rasul. They might be even going against an ijma'ah in this issue. They might be right. So is the inkar in masail al khilaf? There is. Like in Masail al Ijtihad, there's no inkar. And there shouldn't be tanazu'. There shouldn't be. Let alone it reaching takfir and tafsiq and even tabdi'. Say, so Fulan is a mubtadi' because he differed with you in a Masail which is Ijtihadiyah. Are we all together? A Masail which is what? Ijtihadiyah. You can't make a person a fasiq or a mubtadi' or even a kafir based on Masail which are Ijtihad. So if Ijtihad, is that both parties don't have textual evidence and they don't have ijma'ah. What are they using then? The scholars mentioned they're using two things. They're using what is known as dalalatul al-fad. The indication of words and what they mean. This is aab, this is khas, this is mutlaq, this is muqayyad, this is mujmal, this is mubayyad. That's what they're using. The second one is they're using maqasid al-shari'ah. Ah. The objectives of the sharia is what they're trying to result to. And this is all based upon independent induction or extraction. This person is reducing this ruling from his understanding that this is Aam, this is Khas, and this is Muqad Mujmal, this is Mubayyan, this is Mutlaq, this is Muqayyad, this is Dahir, this is Mu'awwal, all of this is what he's using. He's, he's going to the chapter of Sul Fiqh known as what? Dalalatul al -Fab. Or he's using the Maqasid, the Sharia. The Sharia came to observe particular issues. So he's looking at what are the things that the Sharia came to observe and look after. 
So what is in line in this issue when it comes to this particular? Ah, hakada. This is ijtihad. The observation of the scholars differ. Each one might see it different to the other one. Number four, لا يجوز, it is not then permissible. التحزب والاجتماع To come together, sectarianism and grouping. It's not permissible. If this issue is based upon what? If a person enters in your room in this ruling, so you say, for example, oh, you agree with us in this issue, Allahu Akbar. We're the masjid who pray 11 rak'ah in taraweeh, and this masjid, you know what, subhanAllah, they're not with us. And so what do you do based on that? What you do based upon that is that you say, we're ahlul haqq and they're ahlul batil. So you make a sect for it, tahazzub, hizbiya. Pay attention. If a shaykh says, fulan is a mubtadir, is this mas'ala ijtihadiya or is it not? Wallah is a mas'ala ijtihadiya. When a scholar says this person is an innovator or he's not, he's done independent research ijtihad. He hasn't got qala Allah and he hasn't got qala Rasul for this issue. That fulan is a mubtadir. That this person is a mubtadir, he doesn't have qala Allah and qala Rasul. Does he? Hasn't. He's not going to say, Allah said in the Quran this person is a mubtadir. Or the messenger said that this person is a mubtadir. He doesn't have that. What he's using is he's applying ayat al nusus on this particular individual. Are we all together? Scholars then can differ with him on the application and how he placed it. Does that make sense? Now, if a person opposes you, you're not allowed to do tafsiq or tadlil or tabdi' or takfir on him. You can't say he's a mubtadir or he's a fasiq. Or, you can't. He's muqalis, he's mas'ala, which is ijtihadiyah. Let alone then to say, we're ahlul haqq and ahlul batil, which brings us to the fourth point. When you say, we are the people of the haqq. Why? Because we agree with the shaykh in his what? We agree with him in what? His ijtihad. So we're ahlul haqq. And these people are ahlul batil. Why are they ahlul batil? Because they agree, disagree with my shaykh in the what? In this particular this ijtihadi issue. Now we're going to go into the 10th qa'idah, inshaAllah ta'ala, which is al-ijtihad al-sa'iq, the ijtihad. The ijtihad which is sa'iq. What's the ijtihad which is sa'iq? The ijtihad which has no textual evidence. Ijtihad we said is something that has no textual evidence. When the word sa'ir is used, remember it means al-ja'iz, the permissible one. Okay? The Arabs they say sa'ga lahu ma fa'al. Ayjaza lahu dhalik. Okay? But the ulama say this. Sa'ga lahu ma fa'al. It means ayjaza lahu dhalik. It is permissible for him to do this. The ijtihad which is permissible, la yablugu mablag al fitnah. It doesn't reach the level of fitnah. The ijtihad which is sa'ir. What does the ijtihad which is sa'ir mean? It means huwa ma lam yadhar annahu khalafa nassan aw ijma'an. This is the kalam of Ibn Taymiyyah. The ijtihad which is sa'ir is that which it's not apparent that he opposes a nas, Quran or sunnah, or ijma'an. It's not clear that he opposes it. It's not clear. This one, لا يبلغ مبلغ الفتنة It should not reach the level of fitna. It shouldn't. It shouldn't reach the level of fitna. والفرقة and disunity. It shouldn't reach it. It shouldn't reach it. And if it does reach it, it reached it because of what? إلا مع البغي It will only reach it when there comes بغي. بغي means what? تجاوز الحد والاعتداء Somebody has now chosen to oppress. This issue wouldn't have brought fitna. This issue would not have brought furqa, disunity. The furqa and the disunity didn't come because of the issue. It came about because of a particular individual who's done what? al baghi transgression. Are we all together? The Masail al Sharia, the Masail in the Sharia, the scholars they categorize it min haythu al nasi ala hukmiha wa adami. Pay attention to this. The scholars they divide the, the Masail, the issues that come in the Quran and the Sunnah, they categorize it into what? They categorize it into two in terms of whether there's evidence for it or not. They categorize it into two. The first one is ma kana fiha nasu min kitabin or sunnah or ijma'ah. An issue that has a kitab. Sunnah, the ijma' that's supporting this particular issue. 
which clarifies for us the doing of this or the leaving of this is stated the second one is malaysa fiha nas there's no nas wala ijma there's no consent the first one you can't do ijtihad in it and that's where the scholars they say lajtihada ma'an nas ama lajtihada ma'a lajtihada ma'a mawrid an nas there's no ijtihad when there comes a textual evidence there was a man whose name was Mi'qal. He used to have a well. He used to have a what? He had a well. Or right, he had a little place where he, water would, he had water in. He would charge the people. He would take money from them. He would, yeah? That's what he would do. The people would go in line. They would pay for it. And would give them the water. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends rain from the sky. The people, they get pots and pans, they put it down. Are they now going to go to Mi'qal? Are they going to go to him? They're going to leave him, right? Why were they going to Mi'qal in the first place? Because they didn't have this water. The scholar is used when there is not textual evidence. When the textual evidence comes, we leave the scholars. Are we all together? Ah, okay. The ulama, when there's a nas, and there's an ijma' in an issue, their ijtihad is not needed. This has a textual evidence. Does that make sense? So the first one is ma kana fiha nassun min kitabin aw sunnah aw ijma'. There's a kitab or sunnah, this is ijma'. La yajuzu taqaddum bayna yadai illahi wa rasuli. This one you're not allowed to go before Allah and His Messenger. Which is Allah's ayah, Ya ayyadina amanu, la tuqaddimu bayna yadai illahi wa rasuli. The second one is there's no nas in it, there's no ijma'. There's no kitab or sunnah, there's no, there's no, there's no kitab or there's no sunnah for it. And there's no consensus in this issue. It's a mas'ala which is no evidence for it. This one, udhina lil ulama, the scholars have now been given permission from Allah. Allah gave them permission. Al ijtihad, to do ijtihad. Fistimbati, to extract. And I thought, what, I, what, I, what did I tell you that they're going to use? What did I say that they're going to use? They're going to use ma'alimuhu, that which they know. Min maqasid al-shar'i al-amma. The general objectives of the sharia and the dalalat al alfat They're going to start using that. This is what our qa'id is talking about. Our qa'id is not talking about the first one. We're talking about which that, that which there has no textual evidence in it. Um, Ibn al-Qayyim, in the third volume is Ilam al muwaqqi'in third volume, page 228. He gives you the what is the babit alladhi yumayyizu al-masail al-ishtihadi an ghayriha min al-masail. I think you should read it. What is it that distinguishes the masail which are ishtihadiya from those things which are not ishtihadi? How can we say this masail is ishtihadiya or not? When do we really determine it? He gives a babit, ajib, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, in his kitab, Ilam al the third volume, page 228. Read it. The kitab, Al-Imam ibn, ibn Baz rahimahullah used to say, Imam ibn al-Baz rahimahullah used to say, that Ilam al is the what? It is the book of Islam. Ibn Baz used to say that, rahimahullah ta'ala. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah mentioned, some of the ahkam of the sharia pertaining to pertaining to what the mujtahid who's done ijtihad a sa'ikh about some ahkam pertaining to the ijtihad which is sa'ikh the first one ibn taymiyyah says is that Allah yunkar ala al-mujtahid ma dhahaba ilayhi if the mujtahid done ijtihad in this issue and he exerted all of his efforts. And there's no textual evidence for it. There is not. There is no textual. There's no textual evidence for it. You're not allowed to what? Reject him and argue and belittle him and rebuke. You can't. Because why? All of you are using what? What are you all using? You're all applying and you're all using independent reasoning. None of you have textual evidence. None of you have it. The second one is...
if the mujtahid he does an action in which it is permissible to do in ijtihad it's permissible idha kana mimman yu'maru idha kana if he is mimman yu'mar a person who is leading the people then he has to be followed he has to be what he has to be followed like an imam so an imam does something which there is a ijtihad in this particular issue then he should be followed in it for example he does qunut you do qunut with them or he leaves off the qunut you leave off the qunut because this is a mas'ala which is but he's a leader he's leading the prayer you follow him in what he's doing the third one is la yajuzu it is not permissible and yudhkar al mujtahid that the mujtahid is mentioned in what? Ijtihad and sa'igh and he done ijtihad which is sa'igh you can't call him names ah. you can't call him a fasiq rather it's obligatory for you to love him and show allegiance to him because what he's done is a what? Ijtihad what's the evidence for this issue? the evidence for this is is the statement of Allah tabarak wa ta'ala وَمَخْتَلَفَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ the ones who were given the scripture, they did not differ between themselves. After it came to them knowledge, they did not differ between themselves, except when they came with what? When they transgressed on themselves. Look at Ibn Kathir and he said, Some of them transgressed on others. So they differed upon they differed themselves <coughs> in the truth لِتَحَاسُدِهِمْ وَتَبَاغُضِهِمْ وَتَدَابُرِهِمْ The hate had envy towards each other. The mas'ala was a mas'ala ijtihadi wa asl. It was a mas'ala that wouldn't have brought this unity. We would have loved one another. We would have went our separate ways. But knowing that, each person is striving towards the truth. But what happened? بَغَى بَعْضُهُمْ عَلَى بَعْضٍ Some of them transgressed on the others by calling them names, by belittling them. فَاخْتَلَفُوا فِي الْحَقِّ Then they now started to dis disagree in the truth. The matter didn't just restrict itself to this issue. It became so, so bad that when the truth comes from this person, because it came from him, you won't take it. It will lead to that. لِتَحَاسُدِهِمْ وَتَبَاغُضِهِمْ وَتَدَابُرِهِمْ because of the hate and the jealousy and the enmity that they have in their hearts towards each other. فَحَمَلَ بَعْضٌ بُغْضَ الْبَعْضِ The hate that they had for one another, it forced them to what? عَلَى الْبُعْضُ الْبَعْضِ الْآخَرِ عَلَى مُخَالَفَةِ فِي جَمِيعِ أَقْوَالِهِ وَأَفْعَالِهِ وَإِنْ كَانَتْ حَقَّهِ To oppose him in everything that he says, even if the truth is with him. You want to take it. But it was at the beginning of the mas'ala which was what? A mas'ala ijtihadiyya which they could differ upon. But now it went you have now said the truth, I won't take it because you said it. Because you what? You said it. But idhalika, where does this apply to us in da'wah? The way that it applies to us is what? If a qadi gives a qada in an issue, if a judge passes a judgment in an issue, or a scholar gives a fatwa in an issue, based upon an ijtihad which is sa'ir, an ijtihad which is permissible. Okay? But this opposes the four A'imah al-Arba'ah. It opposes Abu Hanifa, and Imam Malik, and Imam Shafi'i, and Imam Ahmad. It opposes all of them. You're not allowed to what? لا يشرع الإنكار عليه. You can't do inkar on him. Because he fought when he goes to four A'imah. Why? ما دام لم يخالف نصا ولا إجماع. Because he never opposed a textual evidence, and he didn't oppose an إجماع. Okay? If he opposes all of the four A'imah, and when he some people today, they will say to you, Fulan, his kalam is not taken. Why? Because he's in a position to the four a'immah al-arba'ah. The four a'immah al-arba'ah can still make a mas'ala ijtihadiyah, sah? Naam, we say that it's hard to find a mas'ala which they all, it can happen, like it is not very common to find them all go on against an issue that the truth is on the other side. But it can happen. Also, if a person chooses to do a curse on a particular individual, 
who is a sinner, who is doing sin openly, and you curse them by name. This is minal masail illati yasuru fiha al-ijtihad. The khilaf in this issue is a khilaf which is sa'ir. Fala yajuzu, it is not permissible. Ayyuri tahada bayna al-muslimina furqatun wa khilafa. It shouldn't be disunity amongst ourselves. Since we all believe this action is filthy, since we all believe that we can cast the people drink khamar in general, the only thing that we differ upon is we can, can we do a la'an, curse on this particular individual, is what we differ upon. This is a mas'ala which is what? Mimma yasuru fihi al-ikhtilaa, ijtihad. The ijtihad is what? <coughs> we'll stop there inshallah ta'ala, I think we can't finish. But we have to do to tomorrow the other part of the qawaid. And then we have to leave the dawabit for Monday. What do you guys think? Yeah? We'll do that inshallah ta'ala. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Astaghfiruk wa atubu ilayhi.